Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our bi-weekly COVID meetup and check-in. My name is Amelia um, and thank you so much for coming here today. Um, we do actually have quite a few things on our agenda. Um, a lot of these are just kind of discussion topics, um, things to think about and things to share. Uh, so not necessarily prescriptive in any way, but just things that have come up that we figured would be good to bring forth to the group. So we'll be talking about, um, first we'll start off with our three deep breaths. And then I thought it would be good to include in our meetups, having a time to talk about the good things that are happening in our lives um, and sharing our joys just to kind of start off on a nice note. Uh, talking about communication plans, COVID exposure action plans, quarantining materials, talking about airborne transmission and computer usage, and then um, ending with three deep breaths, um, just to sort of center ourselves as we start and as we end. So these, of course, are the things that we've listed, but we can also talk about other topics as you all see fit. So feel free to bring up anything else um, that you would like to discuss as well. So the first thing is our 3D breath. This is a picture of Grinnell Lake, I believe, taken by Tracy. Tracy has graciously sent me many pictures of her outdoor adventuring. So those will be featured in many of our COVID meetups in the future. But just um, try and sit up straight in your chair or stand if that's what you're doing and kind of bring your chest forward, your shoulders down, really try to open up your chest cavity um, and while we're breathing, try to think of a joy to share, something big or small, whatever you're comfortable with sharing. Um, and we'll do that after we do our three deep breaths. So breathe in. And out. In. And out. in and out. So yeah, if anyone would like to share anything positive, funny, or happy that's happened in the past two weeks, feel free to do so. You can unmute yourself or you can also put it in the chat box and I can just read it out um, yourself. Uh, something positive that's happened for me is I bought a wonderful cat tree um, and our two cats who, my cat and my roommate's cat who don't get along and can't really be in the same room have cautiously declared a truce because the cat tree is coveted real estate and they both want to be on it. <laughs> so that's been nice. Oh, Sandra said my kitty that's been gone for a year and a half came home. Oh, that's so nice. I'm glad that they found their way safely back. Heather says, my joy is that supper tonight is in the crock pot and will be ready when I get home. Ooh, that is excellent. I love crock pots. They're so nice that you can just toss everything in there. This is Joe. My, my joy is that um, living on the Blackfeet Reservation with everything kind of shut down, a few of my friends and I have figured out a way to order um, organic vegetables in bulk and split them. So we're getting really good stuff. Nice. Is yeah. it Our is it is it squash food. season? <laughs> well, we, we didn't get any squash this time. We got kale though, and we got fruit. We got pears and apples and excellent. Yeah. So we just figured out a way working with our local grocer, paying a little on the top, and mm -hmm. yeah, amazing what you can come up with when you when the op when <laughs> your options are limited. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad that you guys are getting fresh produce and vegetables. Also, it's decorative gourd season, everyone. 
And this is Megan. And uh, my joy is that just this morning, a friend and coworker's mom, uh, her COVID test came back negative. So that was really excellent. Yes. Awesome. That is great to hear. I'm very glad. Okay, um, well, let's go on ahead. If anyone has anything else that they'd like to share, please feel free to put it in the chat box and I'll be sure to highlight that. Ooh, Starla says we got extra, ooh, extra rebate money for our LED, LED lighting project. So we get to replace the toilets. Very, very nice. Get that cash, cash money. <laughs> cool. All right, so the first thing to talk about is just communication plans and changes in service. So I'm sure you guys have seen on Wired, um, there have been a couple of libraries that have either decided to close down or sort of reduce services um, due to COVID and rising cases and all of that. Um, so Lewis and Clark, I think just recently sent out a press release and I got permission from them to kind of create a, a template from their press release, um, which after I did, I was like, oh, this press release is actually pretty short to begin with. Uh, so I'll put the link in the chat box um, that has the quote unquote template version. Um, but basically everything is highlighted for replacement. <laughs> Uh, but the, the way that it's structured, it might be helpful in case you have to make a similar announcement. Um, and it's very concise and very easy to read and includes, I think, all of the information points that you'll need to communicate to people. So um, let me know if this is actually helpful. If you prefer that I find something a little bit um, longer or with, with other parts, please let me know and I can, I can definitely do that. Um, but it might just be good to have something kind of bookmarked and, and ready to go in case you need it uh, so that you can be extra quick about sending out information if you need to. Um, also in that uh, link that I put in the chat box, there is um, a social media caption. So if you need to put something not just for a press release, but on Facebook or Instagram or, or Twitter or whatever, um, you can can do so. The social media caption is pretty pretty um, short. Um, when I was looking around, it seemed it was all just like the library's closed. <laughs> see here for more information. Um, so obviously, you can alter as you see fit, but just something in case you you want um, and need something quicker. Um, also, just a reminder that Canva is a really great resource if you need to do anything social media related. They actually have a lot of COVID related templates on there. Um, so feel free to explore that if you need to. Um, and then just as a, this has sort of come up in, in COVID meetups, um, as we've seen the rise in cases, just thinking back again on what worked when you closed down in March and what are you hoping to do differently? Um, so I guess this is just kind of asking if libraries have started to think about this, if you have a communication plan in place, um, if you do have to close down the building, what services are you going to keep and how are you going to communicate that, or just any other questions that you might have regarding communication. This is Megan and I'll chime in and yeah. tell a little bit about like our thought process at Imagine If. Um, you know, I think we're trying to be really careful about any decision making to reduce services as we try to think about what would cause us to reinstate the services mm -hmm. and knowing that those transitions, I mean, at this point, like any transition or change is just so hard on staff and so hard on the public. And so really trying to be conscientious about that mm -hmm. and always balancing the safety and the access piece. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that if we were to reduce services further, we would go to curbside 
Um, you know, I think when we closed down originally in March, we did not offer curbside, but I think we know enough now about how to do that uh, with very minimal risk and mm -hmm. um, still allowing for access. Mm -hmm. That's one yeah. thing that we have in mind that we would do differently. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Megan. And I think a lot of people have actually found out how well curbside has worked um, for their libraries. And I think actually in a previous COVID meetup, some libraries were like, we're going to continue curbside even after the pandemic. Some people really seem to like it. Um, so that's been sort of a happy discovery. Um, we can go ahead and move on. Uh, no worries if there aren't any concerns or questions about this. But if you do find that there are other resources or information that you want or just other examples of, I don't know, communication plans or press releases or et cetera, let me know and I can definitely do some more research. Uh, so somewhat related is also just talking about a COVID exposure plan. Um, so, you know, I think Lewis and Clark had closed because there was a staff member who had been exposed to a COVID positive case. Um, I think Great Falls found themselves in that situation where the, a staff member had a confirmed COVID case. Um, and I'm sure there are other libraries and other many other organizations, uh, not just libraries who are, who are dealing with this. Um, so we brought this up last time, but just to sort of emphasize from what we've gathered, it seems most people are going through the following plans and having some sort of procedure that addresses these four areas. So notifying staff, whether that's through a phone tree, whether that's through email, and making sure everyone knows where the information is coming from. Notifying your local health department. Um, I had read recommendations that um, it's good to contact your health department before you have you're in this situation and ask about what the recommended closure time is. So you already have that ready to go. Your health department might be, might say it's 14 days. Um, I think some, I think in some cases it was 10 days and other cases it was a week. Um, so kind of identifying what that uh, closure period is and having that ready to go. Um, talking with your board, notifying your board members and having that discussion of, do you need to close down? Um, if so, what services will you be keeping? What can you clearly communicate to people? Um, and then the last step of notifying the public and your patrons. Um, I think the order for these things kind of vary, but these are the main areas for what most people seem to be doing um, if they've had to deal with the COVID exposure. Um, so any questions on this? Is there anything that seems to be missing or anything else that needs to be considered um, or any other concerns that people might have? Hey, this is Joe. Um, so is the state library planning to keep that um, that dashboard up with library status? Yes. Um, and I think in my next slide, I have the link to updating library statuses again. Um, so people can fill that out. Um, I don't think they're planning on taking that down anytime soon. Um, but at least I haven't heard anything at this point. And maybe I'll just chime in here too, if you're if you're wondering um, anything about like how all of this stuff is, might be impacting the upcoming legislative season, season. There is a website chat on Friday at noon that postponed a couple weeks, but um, that's, one of, that's one of the topics Jenny is planning on covering is the upcoming session, so. Might be worth tuning into that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and move on. But again, please let me know if there are any other questions. Um, are there in the chat, or feel free to email me too. I'm I'm more than happy to 
communicate individually with people. So another topic of discussion that came up was quarantining materials. And, and this, I think we had also discussed this in a past um, COVID meetup, but we all know about the Realm project of reopening archive libraries and museums where they've been conducting research on how long the virus lasts on various materials, library materials and um, either by itself or stacked or in whatever iteration. Um, Oh, let's see, there's a chat from Heather. I appreciate the dashboard. I have had people complain about our restrictions when we, in fact, are one of the libraries offering the most services and programming. I am able to refer to the dashboard to put it into perspective for them. That's really great. Um, I'm glad that the dashboard has proved useful for that. And, you know, not just in Montana, but like it, across the country, um, you know, I think the default right now is is not, doing a lot of things. Um, so Heather, I'm glad you were able to use that to have people understand that what you all are offering is still pretty remarkable. <laughs> um, and so yes, yeah, so with the Realm project, um, I think in the more recent results, they had shown that in stacked configurations in a climate controlled environment, um, some materials had um, still had like viable virus loads on them um, compared to earlier uh, testings. Um, so I think we had discussed back then whether or not libraries were planning to increase the quarantine period. I think the standard for most places was 72 hours. Um, there were a couple of libraries who from the very beginning, back in March, had decided to quarantine materials for a week or I think in one case even two weeks. Um, so they already had longer quarantine times, but other libraries had said, you know, in combination with the cleaning that we're doing and the three-day period, um, that's sort of the upper limit that we're able to do logistically. Um, because I mean, I think everyone sort of had to commute to find physical space in order to quarantine materials. Um, so I think Kara is actually reaching out to the Department of Health and Human Services to see if there is a recommendation on whether or not we should increase the quarantine period. Um, and she hasn't yet heard back from them. However, she 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 and I talked about how general consensus is that fomites, which is like the viral load left on stuff and then other people touching it, um, is probably not the main method of infection. And with the cleaning that people are doing, um, the risk might be fairly low. Um, so, you know, it might be okay if library staff want to focus their efforts on making shared spaces safer, using um, hand washing and hand sanitizer and all of that, um, instead of, you know, pushing themselves logistically to try and accommodate longer quarantine times and having to possibly alter services or um, change things around in that way. So I was curious to see if this was a conversation that was happening um, in libraries and whether whether that was something you were considering doing um, and if people just had general thoughts or opinions on this. Um, but I think this is a topic we'll probably be like low key monitoring and, and looking for information on and we'll of course update you with anything else that we find. I can say, this is Megan again. Um, I can say we've followed this pretty closely mm -hmm. and I've changed our quarantine times a couple times now. Mm -hmm. um, after this latest study, I think we actually, there was also kind of a reply or a rebuttal or something like that from, a, um, a, I'm losing the word for people who study diseases. Epidemiologist. Epidemiologist, thank you. <laughs> um, at Rutgers University. Mm -hmm. Kind of found some things with the realm study, like that they were using 
more viral virus in the situation than would normally be found on mm. on a book and a few other things that made us feel like and and like you said the fomites um he had some arguments that those are just really not the most like really there's very little evidence of spread through fomites mm -hmm. and so with that combination with the um that information as well as like you said the space and restrictions and the challenges it provides for our patrons of not knowing if some if they have actually returned something or not because it's in quarantine. Mm -hmm. I think that right now I'm pretty sure we're at three days. And mm -hmm. so I know we've talked a lot about it and kind of um, I think we went to four days and five days and now I think we're back at three. So back at three. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it is hard to keep up with all the information and um, make those changing decisions. But I think for us, we felt kind of comfortable with that, um, mm -hmm. given all the, the things we have to balance. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing, Megan. And I do think that most libraries still are at three days. Um, and I don't know if people have, have changed, actually. I think that was just, um, I think that came out from the earlier uh, rounds of the realm studies. And so I think people adopted it from the from there. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's still a lot of research being done. There's still a lot of information out there. Um, so if you all hear of anything that would be worth sharing, please do send it along. Um, as I said, we are trying to keep an eye on this, but you know, we only, we only have a limited number of eyes, so feel free to send anything else along that we can share out as well. Okay. So the next topic to talk about was actually um, airborne transmission. Um, and this was actually something that came up in a school, in the school librarian COVID meetup, um, but I don't know if we've actually addressed this in the general librarian COVID meetup. Um, and so I've included a bunch of articles on here um, from the past few months. Um, and there's a couple more recent articles here. And the, the reason why this came up is because as everyone is starting to move indoors, um, there's a lot more sort of concern over ventilation and enclosed spaces and how to make shared spaces um, have good airflow. Um, and so there's been a lot of interest in aerosols and airborne transmission. Um, and um, so I just went through to find some information. Some of this is stuff that I found back in the summer when I did the school librarian meetup. And then there's stuff from more recent information. I also included the CDC COVID airborne transmission webpage. Um, the CDC pretty recently, I think, um, listed airborne transmission and aerosols as a potential infection pathway. Um, so you can see the NPR art the NPR articles on there from October 5th. Um, if you see this last link down here with the tiny URL, that's actually if you're if you want to learn all you can learn about aerosol transmission, I would recommend looking at that Google Doc. And so the Google Doc is, was created by many, many, uh, it was a joint creation um, between many epidemiologists and experts and researchers who were looking into COVID and, and work with COVID. Um, and even in that document, there's not necessarily consensus on airborne transmission, but it really, really goes into a lot of all the different aspects of airborne transmission. But just to go over um, and give an overview of this topic. So when we're talking about COVID infections, there are three methods of infections. There's the fomites, which we talked about, which is, you know, viral load getting on physical things and people touching those. Um, so doorknobs, light switches, books, you know, whatever. Um, so that's one pathway. The other pathway is, they call it ballistic, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and these are just like the, the big, usually visible drops that are emitted from people who sneeze, cough, talk, 
whatever and other people coming into contact with that breathing that in etc um, and that's another pathway for infection and then this third is the the aerosols and so this is what's become a, a big topic of conversation and aerosols are um, they are droplets but they're very very tiny ones and they can remain suspended in the air for seconds, minutes, sometimes even hours, depending on the condition of the space. Um, and, you know, with each sort of aerosol patch, I guess is what they're called, there is, you know, viral load in there. And, you know, we're still kind of talking about what is the exact viral load that people need in order to become infected. So that's the question mark there. Um, but for a while, the discussion was whether or not aerosols were a were actually a pathway towards infection. Um, and so the WHO declared in June that aerosols can spread COVID and the CDC just declared um, kind of recently that aerosols can spread COVID. And there's a lot of research that's happening right now, but still many unknowns. And so depending on the organization, they have varying opinions of how serious aerosols are for infection. The CDC states that ballistic droplets are dominant, fomites are possible but minor, and aerosols are minor. Um, the WHO states that ballistic droplets and fomites are dominant and aerosols are possible but minor. And then within that, many scientists kind of disagree. So some people think the aerosol pathway is just as important as the other two. Some think that it's actually the dominant way of transmission. Some people think it's a minor thing. Um, so there's not exactly a lot of consensus on the degree of, of potential infection. But what people can agree on is that airborne transmission can't be ignored as a potential infection risk. So they say that it should be included as part of your overall infection reduction strategy. And especially as we are moving indoors um, since it is cold outside now. Um, so just to talk a little bit about HVAC systems, and I'm not sure if this is something that libraries have already started to think about, um, but a lot of HVAC systems are recirculating air, which means they don't necessarily draw in fresh air. Um, and so with any air system, there are particulates in the air and to guard against those particulates, not even just COVID, but just like other stuff, um, people people have recommended installing filters. And that is also the, the method of um, sort of prevention and, and risk reduction that people have recommended for, for COVID as well. Um, so there with um, filter standards in the States, um, there's something called a MERV, which is the minimum efficiency reporting value. And so it's a scale of one to 16 and the bigger the number, the finer the filter. Um, so last I had read, they said MERV 12 or MERV 13 were the recommended um, filter for COVID. And you know, if you have a higher one, then of course that's gonna filter out more. Um, but that recommendation, that, that rating is based on how effective it is at catching particles of various sizes. So let me drop into the chat box. Um, this is a link from the EPA um, and it talks about what MERV ratings are. And there's a link on here from the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, um, ASHRAE. And so they actually have a COVID-19 resources page. Um, I haven't looked too closely at it, but I do think that they talk a little bit about recommendations and um, HVAC um, precautions that people can take. Um, so those are just some things to think about. Um, I think most HVAC systems already do have filters in place. Um, I think those kind of come built in. <laughs> Um, but it might just be a good thing to start thinking about and, and checking um, and seeing if you need to get something a little bit more robust. Um, so let me go ahead and drop those links into the chat box and then, oops, seeing if you guys had any questions. And let me reshare my screen.
I mean, if I can open the chat box, that would be great. Okay. There's nothing new in the chat box after you. Okay, yes. After I'm you now starting to put them in. I mean, I'm, I'm still just trying to get over the fact that I actually know what a fomite is. I, I didn't know that a year ago. So all the rest of this is pretty deep. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, almost done adding all of these in. So the practical application of this information is, is basically that the, uh, the, the plexiglass barriers that we see up everywhere now are just a good idea. Yes, especially for the ballistics um, that are coming out of people. Um, and of course the mask, the mask plus the plexiglass barrier that further reduces risk. Um, and yeah, but the stuff that kind of, you know, doesn't immediately fall to the ground or kind of lingers in the air, um, the aerosols are, are things that can be addressed with HVAC. And I guess if you're like super warm blooded, you could open a window, but I don't know how popular that <laughs> solution will be in negative 10 degree weather. Well, I do think uh, that libraries were, you know, some libraries did have um, socially distanced outdoor programs mm -hmm. this summer with good success. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> depending on how long things go on, that might be worth considering in a, in a few months after we're through winter. But mm -hmm. I, I can't, I mean, Heather, you stayed pretty open. Have you, are you still doing programs or? Get back and Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. So we were, I think, the first library to start in-person programming, and we are doing um, two early literacy programs a week, taught time and story hour, and then a Hungry High Schoolers book club every week. Now, we don't have huge numbers. We have between, I would say, four to eight coming to that Hungry High Schoolers book club. Our taught time really has been one to two families is all. Mm -hmm. And our story hour has been about the same one to two families. So, you know, we're not talking huge numbers of people. So it, I think it's easier for us, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we have, we started in-person programming quite a ways back. Um, and actually at the, at the encouragement of our public health director. Mm -hmm. I think she's very concerned about mental health and early literacy and some of the other aspects of this. And up until recently, we really did not have in our area um, much of a COVID outbreak. It was concentrated in Southern Rosebud County. Mm. So Yes, and and the people people have been great. They're they're wearing masks. I, I led a story great. hour where we actually decorated kids' masks, and and some of those kids every single time they come to the library, they're in their, you know, fabric pinned masks. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. <clears throat> um, Sandra says the stuff we didn't think we had to know in libraries before 2020. <laughs> very much, very true. Um, and Pam said it's it's oh time to think about outdoor programming in cold weather, snowman building contests, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, definitely something to consider. Have you heard, I, I was wondering about this because of course it's been ridiculously cold here. Mm -hmm. What What is the temperature survival of COVID? Do we know that? Oh, I have not heard very much about that. Most of the stuff I've read has been like in an office, in a typical office environment. Um, so yeah, I'm not too sure. I have heard that cold, dry air actually makes it easier for virus and stuff to spread, um, but there must be a, a bottom limit, <laughs> right? No one gets sick in the Antarctic because nothing can survive there. Um, so I will look into that. And, and then one other know. question I have is, is anybody mm -hmm. using, so for those of us that there's no way they're going to replace our, um, you know, our, our 
furnaces and those systems. Has anybody tried some HEPA filter type air purifiers in their staff areas or anything like that? Anybody using that? Because that's something as you were talking that crossed my mind that maybe that would help to get a couple of those smaller ones and just put them around. I don't know how you prove whether they work or not, but you can get mm -hmm. them for a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. I, Heather, I have not heard anything about, I, I'm assuming these are like standalone things, kind of like space heaters that yes. you put in the space. Um, I don't think I've heard anything about that. Um, and I actually haven't heard very much from Montana libraries in general about HVAC stuff. Um, all the searching that I did was sort of on a more national scale and seeing what not just libraries, but organizations all over were, were doing. Um, and chime in there. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, no, go on, Megan. I was going to say we did just recently get some, Heather, and have put some in like our. Um, Big Fork location is quite small, you know, I think it's 1200, uh, maybe even less than 1200 square feet. And in some of our smaller office spaces and, and areas where we might have more than one person at a time. Um, and I know we did, you know, the research to find out the ones that are, you know, hopefully going to help boost that um, air filtration. Um, and then we also put in the MERV filters in our existing HVAC system. Mm -hmm. um, in Kalispell, our building's, you know, over 100 years old or something, but we were able to get filters for that, so. Megan, do you know how much the MERV filters were? I just realized that's something I didn't look into. No. Okay. <laughs> Sean, <laughs> you can reach out to Sean. I know he's been kind of, he's our, handles the building stuff, and so I know okay. he's been uh, pursuing that. And I do think, I, I don't know how much that um, air purifiers were, but I think you're right, Heather, that they were in kind of the hundred dollar range. Mm -hmm. um, Would you mind passing on what, what brand and everything since you've done the research? Sure. Sorry. I was muted there. Yeah. I'll ask Sean to share that with Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Megan. And thanks, yeah, Heather, sure. for your question. Um, and Stacy said, we are actually supposed to get a new HVAC system in Coal Strip this spring, so we'll suggest MERV to our county commissioners. Great. Um, that's, that's very great timing. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, I would recommend that you look at the tiny URL. Um, I think it's link eight in the chat box. It's numbered as link eight. Um, there's a, I think the document's like, 60 something pages long, uh, 57. Um, and so it really goes into everything regarding airborne transmission. Um, but yeah. Okay, moving onward. Um, another topic that came up was computer usage. Um, and I know that this topic has actually come up a couple times previously, but people were asking how people were cleaning computers or how they were changing their computer policy. Um, because especially now with our increased case rate, um, you know, if someone with COVID just walks through the library, you know, not, not, not terrible, but if someone with COVID is, is sitting there for 30 minutes or an hour or whatever the computer policy limit is, that's probably a much bigger risk. Um, and so, whether or not that was something that people were considering. Um, and Megan, I know that you guys had actually discussed this. Um, so if you don't mind talking about um, what you guys had decided, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. This is a hard one, you know, um, again, it's that same trying to balance the access with trying to make things safe. Um, you know, originally when we reopened we did not have computers right away as we sorted through the logistics of it. Um, and then we decided to go with a 30 minute time limit. And so we, once we started offering computers, which I wanna say was in June maybe, um, it was 30 minutes instead of the normal two hours, which was what we previously had. Mm -hmm. um, and even recently we did have, like in the past several weeks, we had a conversation with the um, 
director of the health department here and she kind of felt like, you know, if of the things that we're doing right now, the computers might be one of the things to, you know, dig in and see if that can be adjusted or what's happening there. And so we looked into it and we got the um, numbers. She, she actually kind of called it like the low hanging fruit, like as something to eliminate perhaps to, like Amelia was saying, you know, um, in, decrease the number of like droplets and aerosols that may build up around a person sitting in one spot for up to 30 minutes. Um, when we looked at the data, you know, right now and Kalispell is where our heaviest use is um, and we're open from 10 to three. And we were seeing in the month of September, we saw an average of about 30 people a day on the computers. Um, and then we looked at the average length of their session and it turned out to be like 17 or 18 minutes. And so, you know, that made us feel a little bit more comfortable with offering the service, knowing that you know, one recommendation had been to reduce them to 15 minutes. And we know that, you know, some of those, some people are doing a full 30 minute session and some people are doing a two minute session to print something real quickly. But, um, you know, going back to the, the access piece and knowing like that there just really are not other free places for people to access computers and print in the area. And for the people who need that service, it's really, essential um, swayed us along with the data to keep those computers available. Um, we do wipe them down with alcohol based wipes or cleaning fluid in between users. Um, and we wipe down keyboards, mouse um, and area surrounding it. And we do have plexiglass in between each. We have like six um, stations um, spaced out, you know, there's at least six to eight feet in between each one. Um, but we try to keep them. We actually are sampling a keyboard right now that's like, um, um, like printed from all one, or it's like all one. It doesn't have um, where the keys go down into the keyboard. It doesn't actually have a full, a gap, you know. I don't know if that makes oh, sense to anybody, <laughs> but they're really easy to wipe down and without, um, you know, compromising the electronic abilities of the, of the keyboard. And mm -hmm. so I think we're looking into potentially getting those, but I, I'm not sure if we've gotten the quote back on how expensive they are. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a few things that we've done. We are also waiving um, printing fees right now. So people can come in oh, and print nice. free um, instead of, and it used to be the first five were free and then it was 10 cents a page after that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thanks That's Megan for, for sharing all of that. Me, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you guys have plans for like, is this something that you're planning on revisiting in maybe a month or so, or is this, you know, as, as the situation changes, then you'll bring that conversation up again or, um, yeah, definitely. I think it is something that we're just trying to kind of keep an eye on. You know, I looked at the data over the last three months and we actually saw that computer use was falling mm -hmm. um, and or declining over that three month period. And so that also made us wonder, you know, the hours have been about the same. If people are, you know, finding other ways because they see the long-term nature of the situation. Um, yeah. More people are getting devices. I mean, we are offering the Wi-Fi hotspots and mm -hmm. tablets and, and those things, mm -hmm. but, and the use of those has been great, but um, mm -hmm. I don't know that the two are proportional, the, you know. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to keep watching it and see how it goes. So great. Thanks, Megan. Um, and I do know that a lot of libraries had, um, not just with computers, but with visiting the library had instituted time limits. Um, so I think a lot of people were saying you're limited to 30 minutes in the library. And I'm guessing that included computers as well. Um, but yeah, any any questions yeah, on that, this? That is, the oh, case imagine, that is the case at Imagine if it's 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This um, is Heather um, at Rosebud County Library, and we like Imagine If 
are using alcohol wipes in between users. We have a one hour library time per day limit, um, but we are only using every other computer um, just because of the way they're spaced and our computers are new and purchased with grant money. So I actually contacted the state prison recently to see about having them build me um, that kind of like a study carol, but more like a computer pod where the walls come up on the sides higher than what would be normal and um, the sides actually come out past the desktop so that a person can kind of tuck themselves in there. Um, so we're looking at doing something like that so that we can actually have all of our computers operational and, and making it more of a private little pod space mm -hmm. to, to try to, and of course, when I get the um, drawings from, from the state prison, I will, I will visit with public health about, about that plan, but mm -hmm. um, we're trying to, I, I don't think this is going away anytime soon and I don't want to have computers sitting there not getting used. So mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out how to, um, how to make them usable and still be safe. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good point, Heather. I, I don't think you're alone in, in that, that issue. Cause I think a lot of places have, um, remove the middle computer between two stations to kind of reach proper spacing requirements. Um, so please let us know how that goes. <laughs> this pod plan you have, Heather, working with the state prison to build them, maybe that's something that, you know, once you get your pods, of course, you know, we could maybe right. help facilitate right. the other libraries to get something similar that would just improve that safety and, um, but, you know, also just make it all um, better. It's, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great idea anyway, because I mean, it's, it's always nicer to kind of be in your own space when you're doing computer stuff. A lot of things people are doing are, you know. Private. Mm -hmm. really private. Yeah, we don't want it to be too private. Yeah, <laughs> true, <laughs> true. true. Yes. But, but yeah, it's, I think that's really, really interesting. I'm so glad you've taken that. I hope you'll keep sharing. I will. Now, I have been informed the time frame on that will be a ways out because most of the people that would be working on the project at the prison are quarantined right now. Mm -hmm. So so there's that issue also. But I, I could not find anything that was pre-made that was going to suit the purposes of of what I think will allow us to be safe and use all of our computers. So mm -hmm. um, they seemed excited about the project. It's just gonna take them a while to get it yeah. drawn up. Um, and then I'm doing it in individual units rather than something all connected together so that I can you know, plan for the future. And if we move things around, it's, you know, it's individual, individual pods basically that we can move mm -hmm. however we see fit. So. Um, it won't be cheap, but they do a very good job on the furniture that they make, and I don't really see any other options right now. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, please do keep us updated and let us know what happens with that discussion. I will. Yeah, I mean, just even during flu season, it's nice to have, you know, that extra space and mm -hmm. it seems like a good uh, long-term plan. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so question in the chat box about um, UV wands. Oh my gosh, I did not see all these ones. <laughs> um, I was watching for you. And then, thanks, uh, thanks, actually, Joe. Suzanne has a uh, um, Consumer Reports uh, article about that, about air purifiers anyway. Um, but the UV wands, do you have anything? Um, uh, last I heard about UV stuff is that UV stuff does kill things, but you have to like sit in there, have it sit for like 45 minutes. So the wanding doesn't really seem to work unless you hold it there for a long time. Um, I think that's in general, this is kind of anecdotal, it, but it seems like people have kind of not decided to go the UV route. Um, I'll look into that again and see, but I don't think very many libraries in general are using that. And I don't know if any libraries in Montana are using that. Um, 
And then Suzanne, you had a question. Do you have problems with patrons wanting slash needing to use the computers more than one 30 minute session? Um, and I have heard Suzanne that, um, especially patrons who are like filling out unemployment and, and things that might take longer than 30 minutes, some libraries have, um, allowed an extension um, and given them an hour or so. Um, I'm not exactly sure how exactly they do that, but I have heard that that is a thing that people are doing. Um, I can chime in to answer a little bit about what we do too. Thanks, sorry, I wasn't watching the chat there. Um, we do have, I mean, there are definitely such, I mean, 30 minutes, like being realistic, 30 minutes on the computer is nothing. <laughs> you know, it's a very short amount of time and to do anything um, significant. It's very challenging. So we do try to um, work with people, you know, we're trying to partner with job service so that if people are trying to apply for jobs or um, do something like that, we do make a special arrangement. And sometimes it's in the library, sometimes it's at job service um, in their facility, which is not open to the public, but we can make special arrangements with them. Um, we have also like, um, had someone come after our regular open hours just so they're like less both less staff and less um patron fewer patrons in the building as well um and we've also um you know been <laughs> on the other if it's if there's no kind of real pressing issue we've been just trying to be really firm about it so i know that sounds like two things like we try to be flexible if someone has has real needs, but we also try to be firm in general with it. Bye. Sorry, it's my son just getting home from school. No Bye. worries. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, but I do think it is challenging in 30 minutes, but we've really kind of done it for a while now and tried to be firm about it and that has helped. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we also get people who want to do the 30 minutes on the computer and then browse the library for 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. that's much harder to be uh, firm on. Yeah. Thanks Thanks again for sharing, Megan. Um, and then Heather had said, we have an hour time limit and longer for proctored tests. Um, so, okay. Um, oh, Starla said, we have an hour time limit. We are providing laptops, hotspot kit for testing that is going to take longer. That's a really great option so people can take that um, and and use it if they need more time um, so that's great to offer that as an alternative um, and um, feel free to put in more questions and comments into the chat box if we'll just end with our three deep breaths I found on, on Giphy there's all these like really great gifts for inhale and exhale and they're very relaxing to watch so I just thought I would add one in here um, but again, feel free to sit up straight and open up your chest, kind of pretend someone has a string on your chest bone and is pulling it forward just a little bit. And we can do three deep breaths. So inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale and exhale. All right. Thank you all again so much for sharing. I do have a few last announcements and resources, um, but we are almost at the top of the hour. So if you need to head out, feel free to. Please remember that you can save the chat if you would like to. Um, so you can just go to your chat box and next to the file button, there's an ellipse button. So click on that and click on save chat and you'll have the transcript. Um, but there is an extended license from Penguin Random House for online story times, which I linked here. There is also the Montana services map. Um, so if your library changes service, please do enter that into the map and we can get that updated. So that's the survey123.arcgis link. And then I'm putting the Penguin Random House license, if I can spell, into the chat box as well. And then also as a reminder, we have the community events calendar. Um, and we would be more than happy to have people 
um, add to that. So this is open and viewable by anyone in Montana, and we've sent it to some of our state partners. But if you have virtual programming that you wouldn't mind sharing with anyone in the state, um, feel free to add it to this calendar, and we'd love to share it across to our partners. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I just want to make a plug for our virtual fall workshops coming up. Yes. I think every session still has a few seats left. So um, please get into Aspen and register. And if you're having trouble, just let me know. Um, this is Joe, of course, and I'll be happy to help you get registered. I know some people are planning to watch with a group. You only need to register once. You can go back and claim your credits later on. Actually, I'm asking all the facilitators to take attendance so they'll get those credits in for you. But um, yeah, hopefully we're, this will be, these are all intended for you to attend live. We will be recording some sections of some workshops, um, but they're all three hours and they're really intended for you to lean in and get some good discussion and trying to make it as much like a real conference as we can so that we can all kind of spend some time together and dig deep into some of these topics. And I've found presenters from all over and I think we have a pretty, pretty terrific lineup of, of sessions. So take a look. Awesome. Have Thanks, Joe. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um...